Good morning, Lakeside Church and online guests. It is a good day to praise God because every day is a good day to praise God. Uh, hey, if you happen to be listening uh, last week, one of the things I mentioned is that if I had to sum up what the experience of this kind of chapter that we're all in right now has been like, if I had to sum that up in one word, it would be the word uncertainty. And unfortunately, I think that's still true. But um, I think if I had to pick another word to talk about what this week has been like, maybe it would be the word buzz. I mean, it just seems like there's so many, not information pieces, but snippets of information and speculation swarming around in the air in every moment that you could spend every moment right now on edge if you wanted to. And sometimes you don't even notice. I mean, my wife and I aren't particularly worried that the whole world is about to end. And yet, nevertheless, the, these swarming snippets of speculation and worry that seem to be just everywhere have a way of putting a low level of stress on everything that it can even make it hard to fall asleep. Now, I, I bring this up because, you know, the first purpose of worship, it's about God. It is about Him because He's worthy and greater. But another thing, thing that I think that God intends to do in, in worship when we gather together and we elevate His name, it has to do with focus. And um, it can be so normal to go through in our week and just let the low-level buzz absorb us. And one of the things that worship does is it refocuses us on a more solid spiritual reality beneath all of that buzz that undergirds all of reality. Namely, that there's a wonderful, merciful, loving God behind everything who cares deeply about you, who would do anything to have you, who has done everything to have you. And that this is his world and his moment. And so as we gather together for worship, my prayer for you is for one thing, that your heart would be absorbed by God. And that as you come into his presence, that you would find that when you come to him weary and heavy laden, that his promise is true, that he really does give you rest. And so um, I want to invite you just in this space for the next 45 minutes or so to just unplug. Don't keep scrolling through the feed. Um, don't look at other pieces of news. Just take some time and attend to God. Turn off the buzz and look at something more basic and see if God doesn't let you emerge just a little more different and a little more grounded in something firmer. Let's open this time together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, I am so thankful that we can gather together as the church and worship you, even if the best that we can do is to gather in our own living rooms and to gather up online. We are nevertheless united by the blood of Jesus Christ who has made us all one family as one savior with one future and one kingdom and one Lord. And so I pray that even as we gather in this rudimentary way online, that we would have a real and genuine encounter with you. That as we pour ourselves out in worship, we would find ourselves filled. That as we turn away from all the buzz in the world and turn towards you, that we would find that there's a calm there and there's a peace there and there's a love there. So God, be glorified today and satisfy us as we come into your presence and adore who you are. All this I pray in Jesus' name, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Thanks for joining us in worship. Uh, feel free to sing along as we sing a few worship songs or else just sit back and listen.
Father in heaven, uh, we thank you that even though Satan buffets and even though trials are sure to come, that the reason that it's all well with our souls is that you are the one who is with us through all of it. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus, that you were not content to stay far away from our sufferings, but that Jesus Christ took on human flesh, entered into our experience, bore our burdens, knows what it's like to be us, lived the life that we couldn't live, and died the death that we deserve. And so we want to pray that, um, that in every way, as you've entered into the human experience before, that you'd enter into us now, that you'd speak to us by your word, that you'd help us to know you more clearly and to see you differently as we leave today. God, feed our souls. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, um, last week, uh, we spent some time just talking about what, what I, I wonder if God might be doing in this weird time of coronavirus and of self-quarantining. And uh, we talked about a few different things that, you know, maybe one thing God might be doing is that God might be loving our neighbors through all of this, or that, that God might be um, trying to give us a different perspective on our, our life and our, our troubles and spur some gratitude in us. Or that maybe what God was doing was he was testing the foundations of our lives. Maybe we were built on something that really couldn't carry our weight and, and he was trying to get us to stand more on him instead of other things that can't satisfy. One of the things that I've found since I, I preached that sermon is for the rest of the week, every time I've opened my Bible, whether I'm alone or I'm with somebody else, there are certain texts in the Bible right now that have just been leaping off the page to me because they, they suddenly seem so incredibly pertinent and so incredibly timely. And it's just been really precious in helping me um, just address the current situation that I find myself in. And so what I wanna do, um, frankly, for, from now until you know, whenever we're done with this whole quarantine situation, uh, in whatever measure that happens, um, is I just actually want to share with you some of the things that have been leaping out of the scriptures to me. I feel like I have this burden I have to unload that I really want to share with you because I think it could be incredibly helpful. Now, to that end, for today, we're actually going to be talking about something that um, actually I talk to a lot of people about. It's something that, uh, you know, everybody I've discipled one on one, we wind up running through this. I bet you I've, I've, share this with somebody one-on-one -on -one, uh, at least 23, 24 times so far. And it just is incredibly timely for where we are right now. And it has to do with something called natural evil. And here's the basic idea that I want to get across. That God uses the frustrations of natural evil like a blinking warning light to let us know that there's something that's not right in the world and to wake us up and to get us to go looking for him. Now, this might sound a little bit different than, uh, or this might sound very similar to what I talked about last week, that God's testing our foundations. And, and it's related, but it's decidedly different and I think has some really serious applications for where we are right now and how Christians especially ought to behave, behave in, uh, in the place that we're in right now. Um, so before we go any further, um, I first got to do some definitions. What in the world do we mean by natural evil to begin with? What, what do we mean by that? Well, um, theologians and philosophers have long made a distinction between what we would call moral evil and natural evil. And I'll put it to you this way just to make it simple. Uh, natural evil, uh, or rather moral evil, is something that a person does wrong, right? It's a wrong act. Natural evil is something that it's not anybody's fault, it just happens. It's out there in the world, but we would look at it and just, we'd have a general sense that something has gone wrong in the world. So, um, a couple good examples of this. Um, for one thing, if someone is murdered, that would be a moral evil. But if somebody dies tragically in a car accident and it's not anybody's fault, that would be a natural evil. If somebody came along and stole all of your possessions, that would be a moral evil. But if, some, if your, your house burned down, it was nobody's fault and you just lost everything, it was a tragedy of just happenstance, that's a natural evil. Or, I mean, Admittedly, this is a lot less serious. It's just, it might be a little timely. If hypothetically somebody destroyed the microphone on my camera, that would be a moral evil if they meant to do it. Or if, <clears throat> if uh, hypothetically I, I recorded hours of footage for, and figured out in post that I'd, I'd never turned on the microphone and I had to go through all the work of re-recording it, that would, that, that would be a natural evil, hypothetically. The place in the Bible 
that addresses these sort of sort of natural evils and frustrations, the things that no person exactly did, but, but nevertheless, it just feels like it's not the way the world is supposed to be. The place in the Bible that addresses that the most directly and where that comes from and what that's for is actually part of the creation story. Specifically, it's in Genesis chapter three. Now, before I get into that, um, just a little bit of a disclaimer here. Whenever you get into the creation story, people tend to instantly get sidetracked and they tend to, to instantly, like, like moth to the flame, be drawn to the whole discussion of, okay, how do we understand the creation story? Is it, is it six literal days or is it, is it millions of years? And look, those questions really matter. Those questions don't bother me at all. I think there's great answers to that. Um, it's stuff I found really helpful. I'm more than willing to discuss that. But I think that kind of misses the point in some way, and I want to stay focused on regardless of whatever side of that, what the text clearly intends. What Genesis chapters 1 through 3 are really doing is they're really orienting us to the world we find ourselves in. They're telling us who we are, who God is, and um, what our relationship to the world is, and what has gone wrong in the world. Now, uh, the story... The story in the Bible, it starts out this way. It starts out with a few characters being introduced. And how they're introduced actually plays into explaining quite a bit what we're going through right now. The way they're introduced is, first of all, there, there's God. It says that, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, God, he's eternally self-existent. There's nobody before him. Uh, he is what is upholding all of reality. He creates it all. And he doesn't create it because he does it accidentally and, or he doesn't do it because uh, he had a particular need that needed to be fulfilled. Like an engineer makes, a, makes a, an item for, for use. And by, that, by the way, is how it worked with most of the ancient Near Eastern gods anybody had kind of made up. God wasn't like that. God created purely for the enjoyment, more like how an artist creates a painting. And so he creates the world, and there, there's this beautiful poetic verse going, going through in Genesis chapter 1 about how he creates everything. And after every segment, he says, oh, that is good. Like an artist stepping back, and after each segment, just going, oh, that is good, that is beautiful. I love it, I love it, I love it. And then the second, so you have God, you have the world that he created. And then the, the other personal character who is mentioned is Adam. And God creates Adam, and it says God creates man um, and woman in point of fact, by the way, both, um, in his own image. And God looks at Adam and says, oh, that is very good. Now, when, when the Bible says that Adam is created in the image of God, it separates him from the rest of creation. It indicates that there's this pleasing connection between God and Adam that's central to Adam's identity and the experience of what it would mean to be human is being made in the image of God and having this pleasing and close connection with a creator. But there's more that's shown about his identity. Because as he's created, and this all comes out subtly in sort of this like Hebrew, Hebrew poetic wordplay. And um, the other thing that's shown to us is that there's also this pleasing connection between the man and working the ground. When, when, uh, God, when he's created in the image of God, it says God created him out of the dust of the earth. And there's this subtle wordplay that starts to take place where the Hebrew word for man here is Adam, and the Hebrew word for earth is Adama. So you have the Adam comes from the Adama, indicating that there's this sort of pleasing connection between the man and the ground. And that's confirmed when God gives him a job. He, he says, you know, this is the creation. I want you to be fruitful and multiply, and I want you to cultivate this. And so there's this pleasing connection where part of what's gonna make him uniquely human is this identity of, of working the earth and cultivating the earth. But it doesn't stop there. God says, for the first thing, the only thing that's not good so far, God says it's not good for him to be alone. I'm going to make somebody suitable for him. And so God makes a woman from the man, and then here the verbiage changes, and there's another piece of wordplay. The Hebrew word for woman, and yes, this is the extent of my art skills, make fun all you like. The Hebrew word for woman is isha, and it skips to a different word for man, ish. So you have the adam from the adama, and you have the Isha from the Ish, indicating that central to their identity is this pleasing connection in community, and particularly between a man and a woman in the context of marriage, that this is a central part of who they are. And then finally, that there's this pleasing connection between the woman and offspring. When Adam names her, he says that he names her Eve. 
and for she's the mother of all living. And the word, the word that's used for her is actually reminiscent of the word used for, for children or offspring at that point, or, or for, um, for, for living or for, for mothering. So verbally, there's this pleasing connection between the man and the ground, between the man and the woman and the woman and the child. And ever since then, we find our identity in, in a lot of these things, and there's a pleasing connection here. So look, I'll start over here. Um, look at men have a connection to their children unequivocally. But I got to say that when my wife had our, our first child, when she had our son, Will, there's something about the experience of being a mother, of creating life out of your body. It's amazing. She's a baby factory. That is a miracle. And that's a superpower. That's incredible. And the idea of going through childbirth, I was no doubt connected to that. There's something pleasing and central, but there's something especially central to her experience of having and bearing and holding that baby afterwards that, that on some level, I will never get to totally understand. Likewise, at the same time, look, both men and women work and it's a deeply good thing. It's what we're supposed to do to cultivate and create and make. But I got to tell you that when she couldn't work, and uh, by the way, when women first have a child, they can't. And I was the only one that had to provide. There was this, I can't explain it to you. There's something that wells up within me, a, a love for the work. And I'm going to go out there and, and I'm going to kill something, drag it home. Metaphorically speaking, I'm not killing people at work. I'm not that kind of pastor. Uh, but there's something about I'm the one taking care. I'm the one that has to be dependent upon that just there's something about that sensation that I don't know that my wife will ever fully understand. And she'll get it to some extent at work, but you know, and this is also evidenced when, when guys retire, when their career is over. If a woman has a career that's over, if a man has a career that's over, there's an impact when somebody retires. But watch guys. Guys have a much, much, much harder time with it on average. And, and we all experience it, but it's central to them. And God says there's these pleasing things about what it means to be you. But then something went terribly wrong. And this too, we all experience. Um, there's this serpent that comes into the garden and it's, it's, look, okay, spoiler alert, it's Satan, okay. Satan comes into the garden to tempt them with something that seems curious to us. He says, hey, there's this, this fruit in the garden, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You should try this. God's been holding out on you. And it seems like such a simple, innocuous act to us, but you've got to think about what this actually means. To Adam and Eve, when they talk about knowing good from evil, they don't even know what evil means. All they know of the word evil, all they can conceive of is it's just a world without God. It's a world apart from him. And think of the gravity of what this means. There's a God that said, you're very good. I enjoy you. Um, I want to keep enjoying you. Uh, and, and I want you to enjoy me. You're so good. And they look back at him and they go, ah, not so good. Not so good. Jesus would later uh, metaphorically characterize this like a runaway son. Like somebody who, who once said to his dad, you know what, I'm tired of you. I wish you were dead. I just want your stuff. Just give me the inheritance and, and I'll run away with that and I don't need to have anything to do with you. It's the parable of the prodigal son. That's what they're doing. They're saying, look God, we like the garden. We like everything else. We'd like to run away, away with that, but we, we really don't need you. And you can imagine, and right there, there's a brokenness that enters the world, this pleasing connection, this thing that's central to their identity above all else gets broken. And ever since then, human beings have always had this sense of being disconnected from something. We all seem to know two things. For one thing, we seem to know that there is sort of a transcendent reality, something beyond all of it. The second thing we know is that for whatever reason, we feel distant from it and it's everywhere. I had a friend who was a missionary and he uh, once got to go into a village where English speakers really hadn't been yet. And it was a village that was sort of untouched by what we would call civilization in general. And they go in there and they've just started to translate the language. As they walk into the village for the very first time, they see a couple of things they see what looks like a temple in the middle of the town. There's some sense this tribe that hasn't been taught by any Westerners or anyone else for that matter seems to have this deep sense there's something divine. And the other thing they had, there were sacrifices tied up in the trees. 
Why? Because they have this sense that there's something transcendent, there's something we're supposed to be connected to, and yet there's a problem and somehow we have to get over it. Everybody has this. Adam and Eve, as a consequence of this, when they're disconnected from God, there's two things that happen to them that also happen to us. One of them is guilt. They, they run and hide. You see, guilt is the sensation that you've done something wrong and so something is coming for you. They hear the footsteps of God and it feels like the footsteps of consequences. We have all done things where when we stare at it, it makes us nervous because we feel like something is coming for us. And they're filled with guilt. The other impact is shame. Now, guilt is the sense of having done something wrong. Shame is the sense that because of that, I am something wrong. And so they go into the leaves and they cover up and they can't even be comfortable in their own skin anymore. And you and I have that too. Because we're disconnected from God, we cannot feel comfortable with ourselves. We look in the mirror and something seems terribly wrong. And you know what we tend to respond? Here's how we respond. We respond by running away and hiding just like they did. Except the way that we tend to do it is we tend to sort of anesthetize ourselves. We all have the sense that there's something more to this life, that we're disconnected from some greater sense of meaning or transcendence or something spiritual, namely God. But we have, have the sense that we don't know how to get across that line. And so what we tend to do is to anesthetize ourselves against that sense. And it's really curious because other creatures don't have this. You don't see existential anxiety in a cow. You don't see a monkey wondering if they're disconnected from a creator or making a temple, and yet people do because we're created in the image of God, and yet that is what has been broken. Sigmund Freud uh, once observed, he said this, he argued that the primary drive of all human beings is pleasure. Now, one of his opponents, I think, corrected him and put it much better. He said, no, the single drive of human beings is the desire for meaning. But when they can't find that, they medicate with pleasure. And what we tend to do is we tend to dull ourselves. The sense that we're disconnected from something, instead of searching, we retreat into these things. We anesthetize ourselves with things like buying, eating, and drinking. Empty physical relationships going from one to the next. Binge watching or whatever other subtle pleasures we can, but like an addict, we build up with a tolerance and after a while it never seems enough because that is not what our souls hunger for. And to be totally honest, the worst thing that God could do would be to leave us to that and let us just slowly start passing away. Now, God doesn't do that though. Curiously, what God should have done is God should have wiped them out. And here's more to the point where we get to natural evils and here's where coronavirus comes in, just sharp focus. Instead, God should have wiped them out. Instead, he does something that some people mistake for judgment, but frankly, that's not what it is. If it were total judgment, what God would do is he would just throw paint onto the painting and just start over, but he doesn't. Instead, he introduces what, what we call natural evils into the world. He allows them to have suffering like a warning light so that, and it strikes at the center of their identity so that they see and they realize that they need to start looking for something more and better than what this world can offer. Here's where it is. It's in Genesis chapter 3, verses uh, 16 to 19. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now let me take that, that apart. Here's what he's saying. He says to the woman, look it. Because this connection with me is broken, I'm going to allow other consequences to be felt downstream and I'm going to take things that are central to who you are and I'm going to let those things be shaken. He says, childbearing, which should have been this thing central to your identity, this beautiful thing. Eve, you're the mother of all living. It should have been the best thing. Instead, you know what's going to happen? You're going to give birth to children in pain. And it's not just implying that it's going to stop there. It's the entire process of bringing up children instead of being a pure joy that thing that's so central to our, our identity, the idea of having offspring and wanting to do that. Instead, it becomes the source of pain and it becomes something that just isn't working the way that it's supposed to. There's a frustration and like a warning light, it says, warning, warning, warning. Something is not right in the world. Warning, you need to go looking for something better. Go looking for God, it whispers. It, she said, said to the woman, uh, or he said to the woman, 
Um, your desire will be for your husband, and yet he will rule over you. Now, the word desire there in Hebrew, another little Hebrew lesson, that word desire there is not an innocent word for desire. It's not like saying, like, you'll be in love with him, but instead he'll be a jerk. No, it, <laughs> the word for desire that's used there is actually the word that a lion, the kind of desire that a lion has for a gazelle. It's like, you are going to want to rip him up in various ways. And I can only speculate as to what it means by that. But here's what it says, this what should have been a peaceful relationship where you find so much of yourself and being other oriented, instead it's gonna turn into a war. You're gonna wanna go after your husband, you're gonna get in a fight and you're gonna lose. And this is what it's been for all of human history, suffering where we long for marriage and instead it winds up being fighting and men historically have been the ones to come out on top and women historically have been trudged asunder. Then he turns to the man and he says this, he says, your work, you're going to feel it the same way. And this goes for men and women, but especially for men. He says, cursed is the ground. Or, sorry, verse 17, he says, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and you ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it. All the days of your life, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Here's what that means. He says, look, the work that should feel like it's just central to what sets you free. And it should feel something like, like a fish to water fulfillment. Instead, it's going to be into frustration. In other words, in the same way that marriage is going to feel like a battle, instead, Adam, the relationship with you and your work is going to be a battle. Every day you're going to go to work and it won't feel great. It's going to start to be drudgery. It's going to start to be frustrating. You're going to work the ground and it'll be a fight with the ground. In the end, the dirt's going to win. And Adam, you're going to fight the dirt and in the end, you're going to get buried in it. And here's what God is saying. I'm letting these sufferings happen. Warning, warning, warning. Something is not right. Your world is not right. You need to go looking. You're disconnected from something that's supposed to make it right. Warning, warning, warning. And ever since then, these natural evils have been what drive people to go and look for God. Now, knowing this, what do you suppose the effect would be of a big nationwide, now strike that, global natural evil called the coronavirus that's disrupting our way of life? I mean, look at what it's doing and then start to wonder what God is doing. For one thing, it is definitely striking our work. And you're definitely seeing those frustrations take place now. Like, I know people who have poured so much of themselves into cultivating a great position and a great career, finding the right job that just so matches their passions. Getting job security and position and pay and all the things that they want to get to. I know a few people who have just reached that, who right now are looking down the barrel of a layoff and wondering what's going to happen. It's as though there's a blinking warning light going off in their life. Warning, something's not right in the world. This is not the way that it's supposed to be. Warning, you need to go looking for something more or someone more. Or what about the other frustrations? You know, one of the frustrations, and I'm just going to say it, one of the frustrations that people are experiencing right now is right here relationally in this family unit. Some people heading into this quarantine already had marriage and family problems that they were struggling with. And to me, this isn't hypothetical. I, I know these, I've seen these. And even average people who would say they're doing really well, like I think Sarah and me, like, I like to think we have an amazing marriage. And yet, you know, you know what I find? I find that because the, we're out of rhythm right now and because we're in each other's space and everything's a little messed up and we're, we're both a little bit tense, I find that we're picking at each other more right now. And I know that for other couples, there's this relational strife and frustration that's coming out of this experience. True or false, we are experiencing disruption in our relationships, in our marriages, with our children, in our spaces, with our friendships, or isolation from them. There's this warning light going off in so many, so many people's lives. Warning, warning, warning. Things are not the way that they're supposed to be. And you can take this of so many different other of people's rhythms and pleasures and comforts, and right now they are all in jeopardy. Now, what do you suppose that God might be doing with that right now, if not making a warning light to wake people up to their need for him? And to me, this is not a hypothetical. To me, this is actual. Here's a quick question. How many phone calls do you suppose I get in an average week from somebody saying, just a cold call, saying, uh, 
Pastor Dave, we've never met before. I'd like to introduce myself, but I just need to make a new connection with God. Can you help me do that? Or can you help me return to church? I'll, I'll wait, just make a guess. Uh, how many of those phone calls do you think I get? Okay, yeah, you got a number? Here's the number, I'll round, I'll round it to the nearest 10. The number is zero. That never happens. I have people that I tend to run into in relationship and maybe they're in a situation and I bring up God and we have to get around to it. But now how many of those phone calls do you suppose I've gotten this week from people who are trying to feel out their way back into religion and that's expressly what they're coming for? How many of those phone calls do you think I've gotten this week? I'll, I'll let you make your guess. It's six. I've gotten six contacts from people reaching out expressly talking about either how do I start a relationship with God or what is God doing right now? And they're people who are not connected to church, not connected to God, sometimes even strangers I didn't even know. Now, if that's the case in my life as a pastor, what are the odds, and I'm talking to the Christians right now, for those of you who are kind of tangentially connected to church, and I know some of you who are watching, and I'm glad that you are, or really tangentially connected to God, for those of you who are Christians, what do you suppose God might be doing in all the people who are surrounding you right now? Now, maybe he's tested the foundations of your life and you've realized that you need to build more of your life on him. But there are some people who are never made, met, have never met him before who have anesthetized themselves to their need for him and it is uncomfortably re-emerging right now. And you need to know this, the same God who has all the hairs on your head numbered knows every name of every person that he has surrounded you with and he's done that for a reason. You know, um, it is not my job alone in God's eyes to introduce people to Jesus. My job description in the Bible is to equip the saints for good works and for witness, that's, that's you. And I'm convinced that God wants to use you to reach out to people who right now there's a unique moment where I think people are hungry and they're looking around and you're in a position where God wants to use you. And, and I think that that's where you're at right now. And so here's what I'm gonna do. Um, I'll let you in on a little secret. As a pastor, right now, if I wanted to take it easy over the next few weeks and still kind of get credit for the work, it actually wouldn't be that hard. You see, because the, to illustrate, the last uh, week or so I had before all of this stuff hit is about like mm, 52, 53 hours of work. Out of those hours, uh, 29 of those hours were spent either in or preparing for meetings. Now, none of those hours are happening. So if you do the math around, I could probably get my job done in about half the time I'd normally spend doing it and just do nothing else. And here, you guys probably wouldn't think a whole lot of it. A lot of people don't even know I do other things other than what I do on Sunday anyway. So it would just look the same as what it's normally looked. Now, I could do that, but here, I feel a burden for you because I think that God wants to use you to reach your neighbors. And I feel that God has been working in me over the last couple of years to equip you to do this. I do not think that that's an accident. So here's what I'm doing instead of taking it easy. Um, instead of just doing one sermon every week, I'm going to be starting um, kind of a, what I would call a, I suppose you could call it a teaching seminar of sorts. That every week, midweek, I'm going to start doing a release on a, on a little class segment that I like to call uh, basics. Everybody has to start somewhere. And they will just be 10 minute snippets. And, and some of you already are going, no, no, can't be true. There's no way Pastor Dave can talk for less than 10 minutes. Impossible. But here's the thing, I believe in a God that can do miracles. So I'm saying under 10 minutes. I'm gonna create a video series at or around 10 minutes uh, a piece, just talking about the basics of, of where do you start with God? How do you find a connection with him? From there, I'm gonna talk about what are the hangups that I see most people having as we have this conversation? And from there, how do people just basically start with having a life of prayer and turning a life over to Jesus? What do those first steps look like? And the point of my doing that is, yeah, we could share that and hopefully there's people that don't know the Lord and, and I could help with that. But really, my big heart cry is I want to equip you for these conversations because God has put each one of you in a position where you can look around, you can see warning lights going off in people's lives, and you're in a position, I bet, over the next few weeks to start conversations that you otherwise would have had no reasonable access to, and he wants to use you. So I want to equip you as best as I possibly can. Now, I want to turn over here and speak to those of you who are listening right now who Maybe you're investigating religion or you were tangentially connected to it at one point or, or you've come and gone. I, I want you to know, know that, that I love you, I care about you, and frankly, if I could help you in any way uh, religiously, that is legitimately the most important part of my job is helping you connect to Jesus. Um, and, and I would neglect every other part of what I do. 
um, to help you with that. And, and if you wanna follow along with that video series I'm gonna be, re be releasing, I think it could be very helpful to you. I'd love to hear from you, I'd love to hear your questions. But as of right now, as you're experiencing frustration in your home and in your job, um, I want you to consider this, just this one story I wanna give you in closing. There's a young man I met not that long ago. And uh, when we first met, what I'd heard about him from sources I trust is that he really didn't like pastors much. Uh, now, my first thought then is, well, that's great. We'll have something in common. I don't really like pastors very much either uh, as a group for the most part. But um, pretty far from God, not really interested in God, totally irrelevant. Well, I was over at his house, and I was over at his house to meet with his parents. The, the family was going to join my church. And uh, as we got talking, uh, by the way, parenthetically, they invited me over to membership talk for a steak dinner. And I just want to say, um, there's no verse that says you have to give the pastor steak when you're going to join a church. But if I, get, if I was allowed to add a verse, I, it, it's just a really good idea. I really endorse it as a method to the glory of God and the joy of all people. Feed your pastor steak. Um, anyway, while I'm over there, we're just talking through basic membership stuff. And we get to talking to the gospel that we've already talked about, and I just want to help them and make sure that they're clear on this connection with Jesus. And so I start going through it, and I, what I did not know is that this young man had just experienced something that utterly destroyed his life socially and emotionally. He was probably in the lowest spot that he had ever been in. I didn't know that, though. All I knew is as I was talking about Jesus, I started seeing out of the corner of my eye by the staircase what looked like like a prairie dog popping up and down, or like, like a little game of, of whack-a-mole as his head kind of went up and down like he was listening. And out of, it was weird, because like, I didn't know whether I was supposed to ask him to come upstairs or get like a big padded mallet and just whap and like win a prize or something, I don't know. But as we, we came upstairs and we got talking, we talked for over an hour and he told you what was happening in his life. And neither one of us thought the timing was accidental. And it was really clear that God was inhabiting that moment. So. Uh, two things happened. For one thing, he was interested in Jesus and we talked. And the second thing that happened was I got to be there and, and I was amazed at, at the fact that I was standing in this moment. The next day I came over, we chatted for another two and a half hours. He prayed to receive Jesus Christ. Now I tell you this story for this reason. What happened to that young man was probably one of the worst things that he could have imagined. And uh, what he was going through was really, really, really rough. And at that point, he would probably give anything to take back the, all of those circumstances that have been destroying his life. But I'll bet you that if you talk to him now, or maybe years from now, if you ask him, would you give up those circumstances for anything? I will bet you that his answer would be absolutely not. Because it was in that moment that I, I got to connect with Jesus Christ, and that's better than all of this stuff. And here's what I want you to hear. If you're wondering why it is that, that you have to be in the spot, I can't tell you every reason why God would let happen to you. Maybe the things that are happening to you. Maybe you're scared for a loved one. That's a real fear. Maybe you're scared for your job. And maybe you're scared for your health. And, and I'm not saying this is the only reason God would let this happen. There, there's probably all kinds of reasons. But one of the things God is doing to you right now is he is reaching out. And he's putting on a warning light saying, warning, warning, this world is not enough. It has never been enough. And you need your connection with me more than anything else. And through that, I long to fix everything else and make it run the way that I intended for it to run. And I have to tell you personally, from having reconnected with God myself at one point in my life, I wouldn't give up the sufferings that led me to Jesus for anything. And I, anything I can do, or we can do, or the Christians in your life can do to help you cross that line. We want to see that happen. So in closing, to those, to those of you who know the Lord, may he open your eyes this week to the people around you where the Holy Spirit is moving and awakening them to their need for something beyond this world. And to those of you who, who don't know Jesus, may the sufferings of this current season be ones that you wind up thanking God for because in this season, he introduced you to himself because he is so much better than, than anything else that you're losing right now. And I, I long for you to have that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, um, thank you for your word and that we open it and that you have the words of life because the word is living and active and the Holy Spirit wields it in our lives. We're so grateful for that. And thank you for Jesus who is willing to die, willing to pay the price to put our relationship back right with you. And um, God, I pray that you'd keep sustaining us, that you'd keep working in us, 
that you keep stabilizing us in your presence, your power, and your grace, but that you would open your eyes to where you want to use us right now to serve others and to love others and to serve them by, by introducing them to you. God, a lot of us don't feel capable and don't feel ready. And I pray that you'd use our lack of readiness to show your power, that things would happen that we cannot explain by our own capabilities, but rather by yours. God, we love you. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, I, I love you guys. I miss you guys. I, I cannot wait to see you again. But just for now, um, know that Sarah and I are, are praying for you. And um, take care. Bye.